So what I want to do today is I want to talk about some algebraic combinatorics in SAGE. So the sum is there because there's so much there already that I can't actually cover everything. So I just cherry pick um, some of the stuff that is very related to my research. And I will show you some of that. And um, then I will give you like a small demonstration on how you can use that sort of stuff in SAGE. And at the very end of my talk, I want to show you actually where to find that code in SAGE, because SAGE is an open source software system, right? So you can actually look at the source code. And then we will do some very small modifications to the source code as well, and use a little bit of Git just as a lead into Travis's talk this afternoon. OK, so I want to begin with a story, because um, I actually found using Sage quite amazing and not just, I mean, typing in my formulas and so on, but actually also for my mathematical life, and that's a, the story I want to tell you. Um, so one of my passions uh, is actually uh, uh, given by crystal bases. So I want to tell you a little bit what, what crystal bases are in this talk. And basically what they are, they are um, combinatorial objects that arise from quantum groups. Okay, so they give us some combinatorial tool um, to study, oh sorry, the green is not very visible. <laughs> sorry, but it says algebraic and geometric structures. Okay, so such as for example, quantum groups, affine Schubert calculus, symmetric functions, representation theory, and so on. So Basically, you start with these algebraic or geometric objects, and you can condense the essentials into some combinatorial things. And well, combinatorial objects, because they are discrete, lend themselves very well to computer analysis, right? So we can put them on the computer, program them, and study them. So that's what I want to show you. And I want to begin by first telling you a little bit about what crystal bases are, just a very brief introduction so that you know a little bit of the background. So what are crystal bases? Well, they do describe representations of quantum groups, as I said, but you can actually visualize them in terms of graphs. So for example, here we have some graphs. They are directed graphs, right? And you have vertices. In this case, they are, the vertices are given by some combinatorial objects, in this case, young tableau. Right, so a young tableau is basically has a partition shape, and then you input numbers, and it should always be weakly increasing in a row and strictly increasing along a column. And then we have these arrows, which are colored. So here we have color one and two, and I don't know whether it's visible, but this one is blue and this one is red. Okay, and well, basically this captures the the representation. So this would be like a highest weight element because it sits on the top. And then these arrows actually give us um, what are called Kashivara operators. They are the analogs of Chevalier operators. And they tell you if I operate with this fi, or here in this case f1, I go from this object to this object. Okay, So it kind of captures the representation theory. And I have labeled, so I've called this b lambda 1 because there's this, a single box that that gives us like the highest weight, so that's my label. And here we have one column of height two and one column of height one, so this is lambda one plus lambda two. Okay, so now I want to tell you a little bit more formally what I mean by a crystal. So G for me is now just some Lie algebra, okay? And then UQ of G would be the quantum group. And then we say that a UQ of G uh, crystal is just a non-empty set. So that in the picture before, those would be these tableau that pop up as the vertices. And then we have maps, so these EIs and FIs. So the FI already explained that in the picture, that was the arrow going from one vertex to another vertex. And the I is precisely our color that I had. I had a 1 and a 2, right? So this I sits in an index set. The index set is precisely given by the Cartan matrix of our Lie algebra. Okay, so that's the index set I, and they are maps from well our our index uh, our set so these tableau to the tableau union empty, meaning that well if there's actually no oh thank you, 
if there's no arrow coming out of the particular vertex give, with a given color, that would mean that it's actually um, sent to empty, so it's annihilated. Okay? And then we also have a weight function, which goes from uh, our set to P, which is the weight lattice. So the weight lattice uh, that corresponds to our Lie algebra. And then you want that these maps satisfy certain relations. So for example, the E, which I didn't really define, is just kind of the inverse of the F. That's what this relation says. But only partially, because if you annihilate, of course, there's no inverse. And then the weight function, you want that an fi changes our weight by alpha i. Alpha i is a simple root in our Lie algebra. And then there's another relation between like the co-roots and what are called phi and epsilon. So this phi and epsilon, they are just things that you can read off from the graph. So if I go back um, to our picture, you can see here, for example, this vertex, there you can take two steps colored two, right? So the phi measures how many steps you can take. Phi i measures how many steps uh, colored i you can take. So here the phi two would be two because you can take two steps. But the phi two here, for example, would be zero because there's no two coming out. And then similarly, the epsilon is telling you how many arrows uh, of a given color coming in. So here, Epsilon 2 would be 0, but epsilon 1 would be 1, because um, there's one arrow coming in. OK, and then well, these maps, these Kashivara operators, they are then encoded graphically um, by saying, OK, if I have a vertex B and a B prime, and they are connected by an Fi, I just draw this vertex. OK, so that's how we go from the abstract stuff to the graphs. So in representation theory, one of the major things people are interested in is taking tensor products, right? So you want to take a tensor product of two things and then decompose it into irreducibles. And uh, well, you usually want to know what are the irreducible components. And these crystals, they are a very nice tool to actually answer such questions. So there's a, a rule, which I explain on the next slide, of how you take a tensor product of of things, OK? But here's a picture. And from the picture, you can see, so here I now took basically these two crystals that I had previously, and I just took their tensor product, right? A single box one and this uh, two one guy. And I, I take their tensor product, and you can see that there are three disconnected components, right? This component here is one, and then this big one, and one over here. So meaning that if I take the tensor product, it actually decomposes into three components. And one, thing, one way you could label that is by these highest weight elements, the ones on the top. So actually in crystal theory, often what you're asking is, what are the highest weight elements of my, of my crystal, if you have a highest weight crystal? And the rule is really easy. And if, when I tell it to you, you can already like think about how you would program that, right? But it's so easy that, well, you should kind of already feel that this lends itself to programming. So what did we do? We had two uh, crystals, uh, B and B prime. They should be of the same type, so of the same Lie type. Um, but they could be of different shapes, as, as we have seen. And then we want to take the tensor product and as a set, it's really just the Cartesian product, right? So whatever you have in the one crystal, Cartesian product with the other one. And then remember, we had these maps. So we had the weight function. The weights just add. And then um, the, the fi, these Kashivara operators, there's a simple rule. So either you act on the left, depending on this geometry of the strings, this length, these length of the strings or it acts on the right. And if you think about usual Lie theory, if you take tensor products, often you get like big sums, right? Very complicated. Like if you take the symmetric power of something, you take, get lo big sums. And, but for crystals, you always only get one term. So that's the beauty. And basically, the reason why that happens is because we took a quantum group with a Q. And then we take Q goes to 0. 
And all the terms that have a Q kind of vanish and only one term survives, but it still captures everything about our, our tensor products. So now let me tell you how you actually, how you could uh, think of this rule here alternatively. So suppose that I take a B and a B prime, okay? And underneath I just write minuses, but phi I minuses. So remember phi was just how many Fi were coming out of that. And then epsilon I, give epsilon I pluses, those were the number of things that came into it, and the same for the B prime. Okay, and now I do some bracketing rule. So again, I don't know whether that's visible, but this, so whenever I see a plus before a minus, I'm going to bracket those. So I see a plus before a minus that's bracketed. I see this plus before that minus that's bracketed. And in my mind, I'm going to remove those, and afterwards I have minuses followed by pluses, but no more plus minus pairs, okay? And then my crystal operator, my F, will act on the rightmost unbracketed minus. So it's a very, so that's what I mean by combinatorics, right? That you just do some algorithm, like here this bracketing procedure, and afterwards you know where to act. So I act here, meaning I actually act on my B. Yeah, you can do a min-max thing, yes. But if you have more things, if you have not just two, a tensor product of two things, if you have lots of them, you would get minus pluses, minus pluses, minus pluses, and sometimes you might have to bracket a minus from somewhere with something far away, so that's why this rule is actually quite useful. But you can express everything in terms of min and maxes, yeah. So this definition is irrespective of whether it comes in root of function? Yeah, I always, so for me, Q has actually gone to zero. So Q is not a root of unity. Q has kind of disappeared in this combinatorial picture. So this doesn't work for no, actually there's a theorem by Lustig which says that the representation theory captures everything for generic Q, but not roots of unity. Yeah, not roots of unity. Okay, so here would be a nice application of this. So if you take, let's see, say here these are uh, GLN representations labeled by some highest weights and I take their tensor product and I decompose them, then these coefficients are, of course, non-negative integers. And, well, since I'm a combinatorial person, I want to know what are they counted by. And in this case, there's already the Littlewood Richardson rule. But um, you can phrase this in terms of these crystals, and this just gives you the number of highest weight vectors um, in, in this crystal that I just described. Right, so you just look at where the, is there a vertex where there's nothing coming in, that's the highest weight element, and if you count those of a given weight, then this gives you precisely this number. This tensor product, this rule is not uh, symmetric, right? Yeah, and it's... The order matters. Yeah, here the order matters, but uh, the number w is independent of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the rule, I, yes, depends on. And actually, there's like a Kashibara convention and an anti-Kashibara convention, depending on which one you use. Okay, I want to give you one more a quick application because I'm going to show you how to use this one in Sage as well. So there's something called Demazur crystals. And basically what that is, is you take such a highest weight crystal and now we are going to attach to it some uh, element of the, in our case here, the symmetric group or the vial group uh, related to, to the Lie group that we have. And you're now only allowed to take steps according to this W, okay? So, um, and then there's a, a theorem by Kashivara which says that, well, if I take my a highest weight element or if I take an element in this Demazur crystal, I can actually get that by looking at the highest weight element, which I denoted by u lambda, and then you operate with these Demazur operators. So these Demazur operators, so if 
I1 up to IL is a reduced word of my W, then this de Masur operator, so usually you might have seen like divided differences and so on, but in the crystal setting, this is just a sum like this, so a sum of crystal operators. And this is a very nice way to actually get de Masur characters, and let me illustrate that in terms of uh, like a picture. So this was our, um, one of our crystals, right? And now what I want to do, I want to take my vial group element S1, S2, okay? Um, so what, what that means in terms of the crystals is, well, I start with my highest weight elements, and now I allow all steps which are labeled by one. So I can go from here to here, basically. Now these two elements are my de Masur crystal. Now from everything that I have, I am now also allowed to take an S2. So from here I can take one S2, and here I can go down here. But that's it, I'm not allowed to do anything else. So as you can see, this is just like a little slice of my, my big thing. And so people are interested in computing um, like the characters of these because they are related to uh, Schubert calculus and Schubert polynomials. Take S1, S2, S1. Yeah, then you would get the whole thing. No, but I won't because I won't get oh, yeah. the last two arrows. Yeah, so you would get all of the vertices, but, but not all of the arrows, yeah. Mm -hmm. But people, because we want to look at the characters, you, since you get all the vertices <coughs> for the character, you're fine, yes. Okay, so I hope that now I've given you some sort of flavor of some of the things I'm interested in, and you, that you could see that things are kind of combinatorial, so it should be kind of simple to put them on the computer, right? And the pictures that I drew, like if you have very large uh, crystals, it's very hard to draw them by hand. You would have to have like big uh, paper and you will do mistakes. So it's very nice to have the computer draw all these nice pictures for you. And um, in fact, I had already program or started programming things in Mathematica. And every time I programmed something, like two weeks later, I looked at the code and I had no more idea what it was all about. about so I had to reprogram everything every time, you know. And then I met Nicola, and he was at that time um, like the leader of MuPet uh, Combinat, which was kind of like a, an add on to MuPet. And um, yeah, so he helped me to basically write all my code for these crystals in MuPad. And, um, but MuPad is a, uh, it's not open source. So at some point it became clear that uh, this was not sustainable. And then we were approached by uh, Mike Hansen. I don't know whether you know him, but he was a developer very early on who was very interested in uh, porting a lot of code into Sage on the combinatoric side. And he invited us to Sage Day 7 at IPAM. So this is an institute in Los Angeles in 2008. And of course, I was kind of, I don't know, I had just written all my code in MuPad. You know, it took me like a year or more. And I thought, oh my god, now another thing. But, uh, but we went there and at, the, at that Sage Day 7, like we had no idea what Sage is, or I didn't know Python at all, but we started porting all this code into Sage, okay, just to get a feel what Sage is about. And at that meeting, we also met Dan Bump. He's a number theorist at um, Stanford. And it turned out that, so he, yeah, he mostly works in number theory, but it turned out that he is also interested in crystals. So it, he was very interested in this code. And well, after that, I, I wasn't very much in touch with Dan Bump anymore. And um, we, well, I coded more and more and more of my stuff in Sage. And I thought, this is just for myself, you know. At least I can still read my code after two weeks. I can still use it, so I was happy. And then a couple of years later, we were approached by a lot of number theorists, and they, or said, oh, we're all using the crystal code in Sage. And I had no idea that they were all doing that. So you see, the, the moral of the story is that 
even though you think you're just programming something for yourself, if you program something in an open source forum, people can easily get it and they can easily contribute and they can easily use it. So I was totally surprised. And it turns out that, um, yeah, sorry, this is not very visible, the green, but that um, with these number theorists, they invited us to actually organize a whole program, a semester-long program at ISERM, that's an institute in Providence for experimental and computational math. And so what this says is automorphic forms, combinatorial representation theory, and multiple Dirichlet series. So I, at the beginning, I didn't know anything about multiple Dirichlet series, but they have something to do with crystals as well. And that came all kind of, for me at least, through SAGE. So we organized this in the spring of 2013. And uh, if you actually click on this, <coughs> so you can see here at ISOM, we have this we had this big program organized by a lot of us. And there were also SAGE days, like in February 2013, which were related to representation theory, number theory, and combinatorics. OK, and in fact, with Dan Bump, I also wrote a tutorial about Lee theory. So I, when we did our introduction, some of you said that you were interested in Lee theory and uh, things like this. So Travis is writing a big patch about Lee groups and Lee algebras. But there is already a lot of things like root systems and so on in SAGE. And if you go to the thematic tutorial page, this is there. So this is in SAGE. And you can actually walk through this. and. Um, if you are interested in crystals and want to learn more, then down here there's actually also something about, about crystals. So it gives you some background, and then it also tells you how to use uh, some of the commands related to that in Sage. I don't want to go through all of this, but it's a resource that you can look at. So this is kind of the end of my story, but it's really the beginning of the story, right? Because the world kind of opened up, and a lot of stuff is now also used in, in number theory. So now what I want to do is t uh, show you a little bit in a Sage notebook how you can actually use these crystals in Sage itself, OK? So I prepared some notebook, which I called Sage Days Chennai. Is that big enough, or is that too small? Mm -hmm. Is this better? OK, so here is a way of how you can build a crystal in Sage. So there are lots of different crystals, but the ones that I discuss are actually the ones corresponding to Tableau, right? And so you do crystals. And in fact, if you want to see what the, all the crystals are, I could do that actually here all the crystals that are in Sage, you can just do crystals, dot, and then tap completion. And there's like a huge list which goes off the screen of all the crystals that are in Sage. Okay. So after we started working on this, a lot of other people started contributing, like uh, Travis, Ben Salisbury, and other people. They've all contributed uh, crystals to Sage. OK, so this is a way we can make a crystal. And then it says, this is a crystal of tableau of this lead type, C2, and the shape, right? This was the shape of the tableau that we have. Then we remember I had this weight lattice. So Sage also knows about the weight lattice. And notice that, so once I make my B, right, this is now, Sage is an object-oriented programming language. so. Once I make my crystal, it knows about all the things that should be attached to a crystal. So knowing that there should be a weight lattice is known by just saying B dot. And then this, this means this is like attached to the crystal. And then we can look at like a basis, for example. So of, of our weight lattice, this is just the ambient lattice. So a base, the first basis vector would just be 1, 0. The second one would be 0, 1. Right? So the basis itself is some 
finite family. Um, and I can actually list all elements in my, my crystal. Okay, so these would now be the vertices of the crystal. So remember I had one, there was just a one, two, two bar, one bar, that was a simple crystal, and these are precisely the elements. No, I had one, two, three. No, I had a, I you think, or oh, perhaps that was type A. Yeah. yeah, okay, so this is type C, okay. So it's, a, it's kind of the analog of what I had, but for type C. Okay, and then you might also just want to make an element of a crystal, right? So one way you can do it is do B dot an element, but we can also just make one. And this rows equal just means we are entering everything by row because we have a tableau, so you enter everything by row. There's only one row here, right? So this would be just the minus two. We can ask for its weight. And the weight, I should say, in terms of the tableau model, it just counts how many ones there are. In the, so the first slot tells you how many ones there are, the second slot how many twos there are. But in type C, we have pluses and minuses. So it tells us how many twos minus the number of minus twos and so on. Okay? So that's why the weight is actually minus zero minus one because we have a minus two there. And then we can take this and operate with our Kashiwara operator. And so we get uh, from minus two to minus one. And if you actually want to view the whole crystal, so last night this took actually a while before it popped up, but hopefully it will pop up at some point. Oh, here. So this is the crystal. So you have a one to a two to a two bar to a one bar. So two bar and minus one is kind of the same thing, right? OK, now let's do a tensor products of crystals. OK, so now I want to take the tensor product of three crystals of type A, all of shape 1, 1. OK, so I first make my crystal. Then I tell it to take the tensor product of three of those crystals. And then it tells me it's a full tensor product of, and there's a lot of output because it tells us all the things that are in there. So the output is a little long, but descriptive. And then remember, for our Littlewood Richardson coefficient, we really wanted to know what are the highest weight vectors. So now I'm going to run through my crystal, and whenever I see a highest weight vector, I'm going to print it. Okay, so there are one, two, three, four highest weights. So basically, what this is telling me is what my Littlewood Richardson coefficients for type C are. Okay, so this is kind of cool. And uh, I have to order them kind of by weight, right? So this would be of weight 3 because there are three ones. This would be of weight 2, 1 because there are two ones and one 2. And there are actually two of them because both of these are of that weight. And then there's one of weight 1, 1, 1. Sorry, so how do you know the little, how can you read off the little So I said... Ones and zeros. No, so the little would, uh, if you take a tensor product in terms of the crystals, <coughs> If you ask for the highest weight elements, yeah. these would be the top things in my component. So, yeah. in this, so I'm actually drawing them here now. So I have, in this case, I have four components. I'm which no, but I'm just asking. Uh, the little bit Richardson coefficients are four of these four ones, and the rest are all zeros. No, uh, one two one because two. these are these have the same weight. One two would appear twice. That's right. Mm -hmm. So there's one one. One, two, and uh, two, one, and one. Yes. And then, uh, yeah, oh, related one. to the. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is a little big, but uh, there should be four components, but I think it goes off the screen, right, uh, in my picture here. So, this would be one component, and then if I move over, you can see all the other components, right? And those two are identical. Yeah, those two are identical, and then there should be one more component, hopefully. Yeah, one all by itself over here. Okay, so there were four components, and these two are identical. They look also identical. Okay, now let's try to get characters from crystals, okay? 
So the way you get characters from crystals is you take all the vertices in your crystal and you sum up their weights or x to the weight. Okay, so that's how you can get the character. So let's do that for this one, uh, the crystal of type A2 of shape 2, 1. Okay, so I'm going to make that crystal and we are going to look at it. So this should be this crystal that I had in the beginning uh, on my slides as well, right? So this is this crystal that we had before. I can list all the weights. So they're all in the ambient space. And um, so basically, this means there's one that has two ones, one two, and no three, and so on. And now we are going to make a polynomial, which will, like a multivariate polynomial, where you take the axis raised to the corresponding power. So I have to make the polynomial ring in Sage. And then I have to tell Sage that the axes are my generators, or perhaps that's actually already in here, but anyway, I usually just declare my generator. So x1, x2, x3 are my generators. And now we are going to take the sum, right? x to the weight. So that's what this big thing is doing. It takes the sum of all elements in the crystal and sums it all up. And I get this, this big sum. So you, you can do it as an exercise to check that Sage did the right thing. But that's not so useful. We kind of know already from math that characters are really kind of sure functions, right? So how, how can we check and say that this is really a sure function? So there's also something about symmetric functions in Sage. And the way that you make a symmetric function is, well, you ask symmetric functions and you tell it over which ring. So ZZ means over the integers. QQ would mean over the rationals, RR would mean over the reals. And then S is, I define to be the sure function, the <coughs> sim sure. That's my sure basis. And there's a command which says, oh, I can go from a polynomial, right? I had this polynomial in x1, x2, x3, and I, which was my weight sum. And I can pull it over to the ring of symmetric functions, and then it expresses it. it, it, it makes it into a symmetric function. But in this case, m is actually the monomial symmetric functions. Okay, So they just sum up all the monomials that appear. Okay, But we really want to know what is it as a sure function. So we just take this and say sure, the sure function of that thing and coerces this into a sure function. Right? So it knows how to convert from this to the sure function. So I'm confused about what S is. S is not a particular sure function. No, S is like the basis of sure functions. And then so S, S of something, any of S a of partition. S of with any symmetric function would give you the. Would, would convert it into the, the sure basis. In the sure mm -hmm. basis. Yeah, into the sure basis. Yeah, it's not a particular one. Yeah, it's kind of just the, the, the basis. So, yes. OK, and uh, okay. now I, t I talked a little bit about the Masur crystals, right? Remember, that was kind of like a slice of, the, of our uh, crystal. And the reason why I do that is to demonstrate a little bit of how to use combinatorial free module in Sage. So again, we are going to make our crystal. And now what I want to do is I want to take sums of, be able to take sums of crystal elements. Okay, so that's what this combinatorial free module does. I work over the rationals, but um, the, the things that I'm going to sum up are will be elements of my crystal. Now I'm going to take the highest weight element of my crystal. So that's this top guy, which is 1, 1, 2, if you remember the picture. And well, this is really because I told you Sage is an object-oriented programming language. So B is really, or T in this case, is really a crystal. But I now want to make it into an element of my combinatorial free module. So really, I have to define a new object B, which is C of that. 
Okay, and now I can operate with my Demazur operators. And lo and behold, so now I get this sum of elements. Okay, so this, this would be the sum of all elements that you can reach by S1 and S2, as we did before in the example in the picture. And if you ask for D support, that just, um, it just tells you all the, uh, the tableau that actually label our, our big sum, and you can check that this is really what we got before. And we can actually draw this now by this digraph method by just looking at, at the support, and it will give us this picture that we, hopefully, that we had before. Right, this, this carved out crystal. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about like this tableau model. And I mentioned earlier that there are actually lots of other models for crystals in SAGE. And I don't want to go over all of them. That would be boring if you're not really interested or into crystals. But at least I want to give you a flavor. So there, there's another model which is called Littleman Path. Okay, so again of type C. But they actually give you infinite dimensional crystals. So you have some highest weight element, and then you can go off like there. It's like an infinite crystal. There are infinitely many elements. And well, if we use a computer, that's kind of bad if we want to draw something. But uh, the way we can do that is we can just iter over the things up to a certain depth. Okay, and then it's possible to to view this crystal just like the first four layers of our infinite crystal, which is sometimes useful if you work with infinite things. Oh, so it's again kind of. Maybe you minimize. Uh, uh, yeah, perhaps I make it smaller now. Oh. Well, anyway, I hope you can sort of see. So this is our highest weight element, and then these would be the first four levels cut off on the side. Okay, but you can draw it. Okay, and um, the last thing I want to show you here in this notebook is actually something. Well, we are in Chennai, so Raman. Uh, Raman, Ramanujan was here, so I learned how to pronounce his name from various people, and they all said it in a different way. So I guess in the north you say Ramanujan. No, oh, that was probably wrong. <laughs> and Arvin says Ramanujan or something. <laughs> okay. So how would he have said it? Ramanujan. Yeah, Ramanujan. Ram. 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 Okay. Ram. Okay. Ram. Ramanujan. Okay, well, I guess I can't really pronounce his name. <laughs> Actually, my PhD thesis was about uh, Rogers Ramanujan identities. And um, so I, I kind of, I'm mathematically close to his work, or at least this part of his work, because it was so big that. Um, so I want to just briefly show you that. This is actually also related to crystals. There's like a, a relation from f for the Raman Rogers Ramanujan identities to crystals. So there are some other crystals which are not the crystals that we have seen, but they're actually affine crystals. They're called Kirillov Reshetikin crystals, and they have also zero arrows. So up to now we had only arrows one, two, three, up to some n. But now there will be some affine crystal operator labeled zero. But they're also implemented in, in SAGE. That's actually why I wanted all this stuff in SAGE, because I was so interested in these particular crystals. And then we can take tensor products of these. Okay, And then there's something called one-dimensional configuration sum, which I'm going to uh, show you in a second on, on the slides again what that means. And um, so these will be some, again, some, some like uh, it's a combinatorial free module, but it has these coefficients. Like here we have a q plus 2 and so on. So you have coefficients which are 
polynomials in Q, and those particular coefficients are related to generalizations of the Rogers Romanogen identities. And if you actually search the source code, so there's this is, um, search command if you want to know whether the word Ramanujan appears in the Sage source code. This is the first time I did that last night. There's actually not that much. Um, but there is, there's actually some, sorry, it's the thinking. Most of it was just like in, for references. But there was, once it comes up, there was one thing in partitions. So here, in, I think in Eva Hori Hacker algebra, it was a reference in the Ramanujan journal. <laughs> so it wasn't really his work. But I think in partitions, so if you look here, so you just click on it, you go actually to the source code, right? So open source software, you can look at the code. And uh, so if I search for Ramanujan, then it appears here and it says, well, just Ramanujan identities. And it's basically just a test. So it tests whether the number of partitions of n into distinct parts, where the parts differ by at least two, equals the number of partitions with parts equal to one and four modulo five, right? That, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with these identities, that's what they do. And here's just a test in SAGE which uh, tests that that's true. Okay. So that's all I could find about Ramanujan uh, in, in the SAGE source code. Okay, but yeah, let me talk a little bit about these identities. So here would be the first Rogers Romanogen identity. Um, so you have a sum, Q is just some parameter, so Qn squared, and the symbol Q sub n means 1 minus Q, 1 minus Q squared, times 1 minus Q squared, times 1 minus Q cubed, and so on, up to 1 minus Q to the n, okay? And physicists, so number theorists would say, okay, the, these count the number of partitions uh, with parts such that the parts differ by at least two, right? This would be the side. But a physicist would say, oh, this is a fermionic formula, okay? So they are partition functions of certain statistical mechanical uh, systems, and uh, you can count how many, like, configurations there are with energies like uh, given with a given energy level and these the side really counts kind of the partition function for such a system and then the right hand side well a number theorist will say okay it's a number of partitions where the parts are one or four modulo five right but there's a the Jacobi-Trudy identity, which can make this, uh, su uh, this product into an alternating sum. And then again, physicists would call that like a bosonic formula. But uh, I, I don't want to go into detail. I'm really more excited about this side. And in fact, there's a polynomial version of this side. So this Q is just the, the Q binomial coefficient, right? So you would take Q to Q sub Ln minus one divided by Qn divided by Ql minus two n. And if you take L goes to infinity, this would actually go precisely to, to this. And well, there's a path interpretation for this polynomial version of, of this, okay? So what, how does that work? So we take a string, or just a line of length L. L is now our parameter. And at each point, we can either put a zero or a one. Okay, so we have no particle or we have a particle kind of at each point. But the particles can't be too close to each other. They have to be at least two apart, right? This is the two in the number theory interpretation. So we get these triangles because if I have a particle at point one, I cannot have a particle at point two. So I can only get these triangles, right? So I get a, like the sequence of triangles. And then what is my energy function? The energy function is just sum up the positions of where the particles sit. So it would be one plus five plus eight. 
that would be the energy function for this particular configuration. Then we sum up all possible configurations, and you can check. I let my. Uh, I mean, you can any, any number of particles as well. Yeah, any number of yes, grand canon. Yes. So take this whole sum, and then actually this is equal to the m. And then if you take the length go to infinity, then you get precisely like a path interpretation for the left-hand side of your rogers romanogen identities. But now once you had this path interpretation, now we are kind of back to the crystals where we started our talk, okay? Because these you can interpret, uh, well, you have to do some more massaging, but you can interpret these kind of as tensor product of crystals. And um, then this energy function you would get by actually affinizing your crystal and using this affine crystal operator. So you can actually, once you have that kind of viewpoint, you can generalize these identities and you can start with other solvable lattice models, not just this line with the triangles. You can put more than one particle at a point or have different representations at, at each point, right? So that this would be different lattice model. Then if you do the beta ansatz, you get to something called rigged configurations and they give you precisely these, the, the left-hand side, these fermionic, uh, the fermionic side of the rogers romanogen identity. And then if you uh, go the other way, if you use the corner transfer matrix method, you get actually highest weight crystals, and then lo and behold, because they come from the same thing, there should be a bijection between those. And that's a famous bijection by, well again, you can't read it, sorry, but by Kerov, Kirillov, and Reshetikin. And it gives you a huge set of generalizations of these very nice identities and a physical interpretation. And in, actually in 2001, there was this conjecture, the x equal to m conjecture by Hatayama, Kuniba, Okado, Tsuboi, Tagaki, and Yamada, I think, so a Japanese group in Kyoto. Or people always often say the Kyoto group. And uh, so from the lattice model, they got like a vast set of generalizations, and we are still trying to prove them. They are proved in certain cases, but so Travis is uh, working on rig configurations, for example. Okay, but this give, goes back now to the beginning of my talk, um, where I talked about these, uh, these crystals. Okay, so I have 10 more minutes, right? That's kind of the end of my mathematical uh, uh, intro, uh, story and some demonstration of how you can use that in SAGE. Now what I want to do is let's actually go into the SAGE source code and see where all this stuff is because at the end of the day you might want to implement your own crystal or if not something else. I mean it doesn't really matter. And you want to know how to find things. So one thing, one way to find things is by the source underscore SRC, right? Search. Yeah, so sorry, search. Yeah, search underscore SRC. Uh, but another way would be just to go, so if you want to do this, follow this, you have to know now where Sage is installed on your machine. Okay, so that's the first thing. Make sure you know where Sage is installed. On my machine, it's in like uh, uh, applications. So I hope this is this is a little bigger. Um, and then I'm now in my Sage folder, okay? And in my Sage folder, I have all these directories, but the source code for Sage is in this, yeah? You can move up to the bottom of the window. Uh, the keys are always clear. So there's this directory SRC, and if we go in there, that's where the source, source code is. Actually, we have to then go to Sage. And in here, you can, for example, see Combinat, but you can also see other things like groups, quivers. So 
the code is somehow structured by mathematical area, right? So crystals are in combinat. So we are now going to go to combinat. And again, LS. So OK, there's a lot of stuff, so you can't really see. But in there, there's another folder called crystals. And here are like all the various files that have crystals, right? Some, some version of crystals. And in fact, the Tableau model that we looked at in my talk is actually in this file, tensor product. Okay, so now we can um, look at this file and look at how how this uh, how this code looks like. That's very small, right? Hmm. Well, anyway, it's not so important. But uh, if you <laughs> if you can look, I mean, it's just so that you can that you know you can actually look at the at the code. Um, so now, what I want to do is, well, I want to now change the code, right? Because at some point in your life, you might want to implement something on your own, or you find a bug and you want to fix the bug. So we want to know how to change stuff. If you just now edit this file, uh, tensor product, then when you mess it up, let's say, right, that's kind of scary, then Sage wouldn't work anymore, and uh, then you freak out, you have to reinstall Sage, it takes like three hours to recompile, so that would be kind of scary, but now I want to kind of give the pointer to Travis's introduction to Git, so there's this version control, way of doing stuff. So now we are going to use Git to actually make a new branch and then make our modifications there. And it turns out that um, if we are unhappy with our changes, we can always revert back to the clean version of Sage. So if I do Git branch, so Git, uh, Sage always comes with uh, Git installed, then I have like lots of different um, branches here, but there's one called master. So that's our clean version of Sage. Okay, and then there are lots of other things like I've been working on. And now we want to make a new branch because we now want to change something and um, we want to do it in a different branch. So I do git uh, checkout master minus b and then we call this something, okay? We call this, let's say, test. So what we have now done, we, we took our master branch. We now, from there, we, not from my other changes, from there we now made a branch that branches off that master branch. And if I now do git branch, then it tells us now we are in this branch test. Okay, and now we can um, modify our code. Yeah, so my Emacs, sorry, is a little bit. Uh, huh? Emacs minus MW? Yeah, Emacs minus MW. Like this? Yeah. Okay. And you can't see the uh, well, okay, so in there, I'm now going to search for something called representation. So representation is a method. So in here, like we have a class called crystals of Tableau. And uh, the representation just is the little function which tells us how Sage will represent a crystal element or the crystal, OK? And I'm now going to search for the one um, that gives us the one for <coughs> this one. This would be the way that Sage represents a crystal element. So what it does here, it takes a crystal element, makes it into a tableau, and then the tableau method has a way of representing a tableau. And now I want to do something else. I want to just say this is my crystal element. 
So what this is doing is, oh, every crystal element in my crystal it won't get a different name now. If it's one or two or three, they will all be called my crystal element. Okay? It's kind of stupid. It's kind of scary. You shouldn't really do this, but I'm going to do this now anyway. So yes, we are saving this. And we can now check git um, a diff master. It, it shows that we have changed this particular line in the entire sage code, right? It is in source sage combinat crystal blah blah blah, and we changed this line from uh, self to tableau to my crystal element. Okay, so now let's check. I'm now going to. I have to recompile sage, but just the little change that I made to tell it, oh, recompile the code with my new change. So I hope this is going to be quick. Yesterday it took like two hours, but it should be fine. OK, so now it's starting up Sage. And now we are going to make a crystal and an element and check whether it is actually. So I'm going to make this. I'm going to make an element. And it says be my crystal element <laughs> instead of what it did before, right? So now we freak out, oh, we have changed Sage. We don't want other people to see this. Let's quit Sage. Let's go back to our master branch. And so you can actually commit, because I want to get rid of this uh, change, I'm going to do commit minus A. So I'm actually now going to commit these this change to my test branch. OK, so stupid change. Yeah, so now I committed that to my test branch. So um, Travis will talk more about this kind of stuff. right? And now I'm going to go back to my master branch. I do git checkout master. Now I switch to my master branch. hidden, but Why here you can see now we are now in the master branch. OK. Now I'm going to do sage minus br again, because now hopefully we got rid of the change, because we are back to our clean master. And I'm going to make the crystal one more time, and hopefully it will be back to normal. OK, be my element, and b it now gives us the one. <laughs> and not any more my crystal elements. OK, since my time is up, I, I will stop here. Thank you very much.